Okay. All right. Uh, cool. So last time we talked about sheaves on definable uh, spaces. Um, and this time we'll bring in the homomorphic topology. <clears throat> uh, but first, brief definition. Uh, we'll be working with locally ring definable spaces. For our setup, these are pairs X together with a sheaf of rings OX, where X is one of our definable spaces. And OX is a sheaf of rings, a definable site. Uh, such that all the stocks just at closed points um, of X you can define in the usual way uh, are local rings. And we talked about how um, stocks aren't as great for the definable site as they are for the usual topological site. You can't always detect everything uh, at stocks. Nonetheless, for our purposes, um, this definition will suffice. And so our basic example is the following. We'll let X just be C to the N for some N <clears throat> with its usual definable structure. And we let OCN, or sometimes I write OCN definable, <clears throat> be the sheaf of rings um, such that OCN of U is equal to the set of definable holomorphic functions on U. For any definable open subset U um, of C to the N. So it's um, elementary to see that this does give you a, uh, a sheaf on definable site, because being definable glues along finite covers, and being analytic glues along even infinite covers. So it certainly glues along um, finite covers. <clears throat> okay, so this is in some sense the primary thing we're going to care about. Um, another example that's going to give us sort of our local structure <clears throat> is the following. So given a definable open U inside C to the N and an ideal inside OCN definable of U, which is finitely generated. So specifying i is the same as specifying finitely many definable holomorphic functions on u. We can define x to have this underlying set, the zero set of i. So all the, just as a point set, uh, x is definable, of course, it will be the set of all points in u where uh, everything in i vanishes. And now to give you the sheaf structure, I'm going to let ix be i times this sheaf, ou 
definable. So basically, on every definable open set, I can look at these same functions and I can look at the ideal that they generate. This is going to be some kind of pre sheaf. You sheafify it, that's what IX is. So a priori, it could be something quite complicated. Hmm. And we're going to let OX be defined as just the quotient sheaf, OCN definable by IX. Okay. So it's basically like functions, modulo things, which up to an open cover can be expressed inside the ideal I times other definable holomorphic functions. That's what this uh, chief of rings OX is. Uh, yes. Uh, shouldn't have wrote O def C N. Sorry, so sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is O def U actually. Oh, U, right. U, absolutely. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> and finally, the pair X comma O X. This will be called a basic definable analytic set. Analytic space, excuse me. Okay, so this will be our sort of local structure for the kinds of objects we want to study. Um, now, a priori, it depends on the choice of U and the choice of I. It's kind of hard to say intrinsically anything reasonable is going on here. Eventually we'll show, or maybe won't show, but it's true. <laughs> we'll show some parts of this, that um, just like for affine spaces, you can define them intrinsically and maps between them really are given by sort of maps polynomials of the uh, overlying space. The same kind of thing is true here. Um, but this is this is how it sort of starts life. Um, any questions about the definition? I mean, very little is clear so far from the definition, but still. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about properties that uh, sheaves of rings can have, which are going to be important to us. So let M be an OX module. And these properties make sense just in this general context with a definable space and a sheaf of rings on it. We say that M is finite type If, so I'll say the following, up to a cover, there exists a surjection from OX to the M to M. So what you would like to say is it just is a surjection like this, that's too strong. What you want is for this to be true locally. And so what this means in our setup with our definable site, is there exists a finite, like a, uh, there exists a cover, X is the union, I equals one to K of X I, by definable open sets, X sub I, and there exists for each of these X I, this kind of surjection. Okay. So that's what up to a cover means, and that's something we'll use uh, quite frequently. We say that that's one definition. We say M is a finite presentation. If 
up to a cover. There exists an exact sequence OX to the M goes to OX to the N goes to M goes to zero. In other words, we can write M as being generated by finitely many functions such that the kernel of this map is also a finite type. So in other words, the relations between these functions can be globally generated. You don't get more and more relations as you go down. Okay, these are still fairly general things. And the last one I want to define before beginning to prove things or to state things um, is M is coherent if M is finite type. And for all maps <clears throat> O U to the N goes to M restricted to U for the fin where U in X is definable often. The kernel of this map. Is also a finite type. Not necessarily the same n as above. Not the same n. As no, no, just arbitrary ends. Yeah, they're changing every time so far. So your finite type. And however you generate M on any definable open set, the kernel is globally generated by finite many functions, again, up to a cover, always up to a cover. Okay, so it turns out uh, coherent things are a sort of very nice world in which to work. So one quick observation. Is that if M is coherent, And M inside M is finite type. Or which should mean M is a subsheaf of M on every finite open set. The global sections of M are a subset of the global sections of M. Then M is also coherent. For the simple reason that, uh, so it's already given that it's finite type. And if I have any map to N, then by inclusion, that's also a map to M. So the kernel here is the same as the kernel. Just an observation. Okay, um, so here is the theorem I want to talk about for maybe the whole lecture. I'm not sure how long it will take. Um, is that the sheaf of definable um, holomorphic functions is a coherent sheaf. What that means is that the sheaf itself is a coherent module over itself. In other words, um, any map uh, of this to the end, which rejects, so any globally generating uh, set of functions, if you look at the kernel, which will then give you the relations between them, then that's globally generated up to passing to a finite number. <laughs> And um, we call this something a theorem. We call this 
definable local coherence because in the analytic category, the analogous statement is a theorem of OCA coherence theorem. Um, so in other words, given a set of functions f1 to fm uh, in over oh, this way, we'll see in the for you with any definable open set and um, functions here. The relationship consisting of functions G1 through GM such that the sum of the FIGI is equal to zero is finally generated up to L. Now, this is kind of a dry looking theorem, uh, but this really makes the whole theory end up working. Uh, this, this, this coherence theorem. It kind of lets you know that you don't have to keep zooming in. Being globally generated at the final cover means you have like a global set of functions, you can work with them once and for all, no matter how far down you go. A priori, the kind of thing you're scared of that keeps coming up whenever you try to prove anything is that if you keep zooming in more and more, you get sort of more and more relations that you can't see. Um, and this, this makes the kind of issue we talked about where stocks aren't enough to sort of glue up globally to show up a variety of things you want to do. So this is really sort of the key theorem from which everything else follows. Um, I want to mention previous work for which, you know, we heavily used ideas and were inspired by Peter Zell and Serchenko. Who proved um, a kind of a similar theorem? Um, so, so they proved the following: they proved uh, that there exists. Uh, so, if you look at this relationship, so the relationship let's call this R. R is um, what I'll call stock globally generated. In the sense that up to a cover, there exists global generators, global sections, R1 through, let's say, R capital M. such that at every closed point, these guys generate the stock of R as B. They prove this uh, slightly different theorem, which they used to do uh, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of tricky to grasp the difference uh, between them. So essentially, if you're looking at just relations at every stock, when you're zooming into every point, you're allowed to learn functions as long as they make sense at one point, then they come from these global sections. Um, so it's, it's a slightly uh, weaker theorem, which ends up important uh, for the sheaf theory, though it is very close. And again, it's weaker because if you try to deduce this global theorem from this one, and up running into the exact sort of stocks aren't enough problem we had before where you have your, um, your relation that you want to show is generated by global generators. Uh, you can zoom into every point such that that's true, but then you can't glue back up necessarily. Um, <clears throat> okay, but, but yeah, certainly an important uh, piece of previous work. Okay, so what I want to do is basically uh, explain what goes into the proof uh, of this theorem, and then, um, yes, um, but I guess 
I don't know why. No, they probably approved this not just for the standard model of complex numbers, but for elementary extensors, which means perhaps that I'm just wondering if, if that is a stronger version that would imply that. That's a that's a great point. I don't think that that's true enough because I, I asked them about this exact question. Um, so you might want, for example, last time we mentioned this, like you have other maximal types. You right. can take stocks there. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And they said that no, it doesn't seem like their proof uh, applies to to those things. They really do use points inside uh, CVT. It's a great question, though. Right. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> okay, so, um, let me begin with just some generalities on um, coherent sheaves. Which kind of tells you coherent sheaves is a uh, nice world to live. So suppose that X OX is a uh, locally ringed space. In the way we were talking about before. And suppose we have an exact sequence of O modules, OX modules. So it's an exact. Um, but the result is that two of these are coherent, if and only of the third one. So coherent sheaves are a nice category. You have kernels and co-kernels, and it's extension closed. If you take an extension of M2 by M1, that's what this M is, then if the outer two are coherent, so is the middle one. Then if two of M1 and M2 are coherent, So is it. Okay. So um, let's prove this. Let's start with M1 and M2 being coherent, implying that M is coherent. So again, mean coherent uh, means two things. It means that you're a finite type, and it means that any map to you from uh, OX to the N has a kernel um, that's finite type. Okay, so um, M1 and M2 are uh, both finite type. <clears throat> so up to a cover, I'm gonna stop writing that. Uh, there exists surjections OX to the M to M1, OX to the N to M2. <clears throat> and now this is a free sheaf. So giving a map like this is just specifying a global section of M1 and a global section, or no, this many global sections of M1 and this many global sections of M2. And the map M to M2 is surjective, which means up to a finite cover, I can lift global sections. So again, up to a finite cover, C lift to a map C tilde from OX to the M to M. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, but now I can look at the map phi plus C tilde, which is a map from OX to the M plus N to M, because phi maps to M1 is already inside M, and C tilde, I've lifted C to M. And now this map is surjective. Let me get anything in the quotient M2, and I can adjust it by anything in the kernel M1. So therefore, M is finite type. This is the first part we need to prove. And now we're going to show that any map to M from O to the N has a finite type kernel. <clears throat> so now suppose P is a map from OX to the M capital M. So now what we can do, so we can, let's call this phi. Now we have also, let's call it pi, the map from M to M2. And this composition is a map to something we've assumed is coherent. So if you let K the kernel of pi composed with phi, then k is coherent. Is the sorry k is finite type. Now the kernel of this map, where does it land? It lands inside M1 here. So we have a map k goes to M1. And what we want is this kernel k prime to be of finite type because the kernel k prime here is the kernel of phi. Now, K is finite type, so there exists a surjection from OX to the, I don't know, capital N to K. Again, up to a finite cover um, all the time. Let's call this a uh, row. <clears throat> this map is here. So now we have OX to the M maps via row to K, surjectively. That maps to M. And so you have this composition here. <clears throat> and now, if you look at the two kernels, you have a surjection like this. Once again, M1, sorry. M1 is coherent. So K double prime is finite type. K double primes rejects of the K prime. So if I have a, a bunch of sections generating K double prime, I can just push them forward and get sections generating K prime. So K prime is also fine. Okay. And then we want to show, which we want to show that any map to M from a globally generated guy, from a free guy like this, has kernel that's finite type. So that's the M1, M2 implies M. The others are a little easier. <clears throat> so let's prove that if M and M1 are coherent, then M2 is coherent. So again, we're going to show finite typeness and this kernel property. So M is finite type, which automatically means M2 is finite type. Oh, 
I want to show that if you have any map, phi from OX to the M to M2, then I want to show um, that uh, its kernel is a finite type. So once again, we lift phi, sorry, phi to phi tilde. Is a map from OX to the M to M. <clears throat> now we let C be a surjection from OX to the N to M1. you could do because M1 is finite type. And that gives us a map C direct phi tilde, direct sum phi tilde from OX to the M plus N to N, just by combining um, these two together. And now the cool observation is the kernel of this map surjects onto the kernel of phi. So we had a map to M2, we lift it to a map to M, which means that anything in the kernel of M2 is in the kernel of the map to M up to an element of M1. And that's what this C tilde is doing, or this C is doing, it's changing things by M1. And so if you just take this kernel and project to the first coordinate, we get stuff in the kernel of phi. This is finite type, therefore this is finite type. <clears throat> okay, so now the very last one. want to show that if M and M2 are finite type, that implies that um, M1 is finite type. Um, cool. So in this case, the mapping property is obvious. So any map to M1 is also a map to M. So if you have a map from OX to the M, it will have kernel that's finite type, which is by the property of M. So the only thing to prove here is that M1 itself is globally generated, that it's finite type. Um, and here's how you do that. So there exists an OX to the M, which surjects um, onto M. I know that it's called this phi. And now we can look at the projection to M2. Let's call this pi. And now once again, the kernel of pi composed with phi surjects onto M1. This is finite type. Since M2 is coherent by assumption, And therefore, M1 is also fine. Okay. Sorry for that kind of dry argument. I just wanted to give some examples of how one works with sheaves on, uh, on this definable site. <clears throat> but the result, you get this nice property that if you look at the category of coherent sheaves um, on any locally ring space, then that gives you an abelian subcategory, so you have kernels and co-kernels, and it's an extension closed abelian subcategory, which exactly means this M1, M2 coherent implies M1. Corollary, 
coherent sheaves. On X, the side of a million sheaves is a um, extension flow, a million subcodes. Okay, so um, the idea now findable of coherence. What is the idea in general how you work with this kind of uh, definable analytic spaces? Uh, is pretty much to use induction in the following specific way. Suppose you're working with U, just some definable open set in C to the N, and you want to study some ideal functions in U or something. So in particular, you want to study at least the effect of a single F. On you here. Now, if you look at the ideal generated by F, at points where F doesn't vanish, uh, F generates everything. So you sort of don't get anything interesting. Like if you look at the zero set of a polynomial or like function, you only care about, you know, you might have interesting important structure where it vanishes. That's kind of fun to look at. Uh, but where it doesn't vanish, nothing sort of happens. So what you want to do is you want to restrict to studying the zero set of f inside of you, because that's kind of where all the action is. Now, this is a complicated thing to do because this is some analytic set. You might have all sorts of singularities and stuff like that. And so finally, the idea is you look at a projection. So pick a projection from Vf to V, where V is inside some Cn minus 1, which is finite. So if you can pick a projection like this, then because we know that uh, finite maps on sheaves are extremely nice, they're exact, studying things over here is pretty much the same as studying the push forwards over here. And so this allows you to go down one step and you know that makes all the induction work. Um, okay, so this is the basic yoga that goes behind the proof of pretty much everything in this world. All the basic statements at least. <laughs> And this idea again, of course, was already present in the work of Peter Zosarchenko. We just didn't talk about it in this language of, of sheaves. <clears throat> okay, so in in this in the style. Let's prove the following dilemma. So the following are equivalent. On the one hand, um, this sheaf of rings is coherent. On the other hand, for all definable open sets U and C to the N, and definable holomorphic functions F on them, the sheaf M given by 
OU mod F OU is a coherent sheaf. If you want to show the whole thing is coherent, it's enough to understand all quotients uh, like this. Uh, for all non-zero f, sorry. If I allow f to be zero, then, then it's kind of a trivial quotient. So once we have this lemma, we can try to make that proof work by sort of studying this using that kind of strategy. Okay, um, so let's prove this equivalence. So one plus two is easy because I have this exact sequence. By definition, basically, if I assume that U is connected, which is harmless, this map is injective because I can't, they're, they're holomorphic functions. I can't multiply something by a non-zero F and get something that's zero. Um, and so I get this exact sequence. And so if these two are coherent, then this one is also coherent. The other way doesn't work, of course, because if I assume two of these are coherent, I'm already assuming the game. You have all your death appearing twice here. So that's, um, that's uh, one implies two. So um, the other direction I want to show is two implies one. To assume that we have two, all these m's are coherent. And suppose we have a map from OU def to the n. OU def given by F1 through Fn. <clears throat> oh Lord, let's assume that F1 is not zero. If they're all zero, clearly the kernel is finite type because the kernel is everything. Assume F1 is not zero. So again, we want to show the kernel of this map is uh, finitely generated, finite type. Sorry, what, what is wrong? If F1 into Fn? Oh, I just mean that's the map phi. So uh, the map phi is given by n maps from this to this. Each map is determined by where one goes. So just multiplication by some function. And I'm letting these be the functions. This is like the matrix form of the right. of this oh, map right. here. Yeah, sorry. So the kernel is exactly the relations between these functions. Okay. So now that M, the OU, I'll separate the def if you don't mind just for a second because there's no undef rings here. So that MBOU mod F1 OU. And we get this commutative square like this, where these two are just the reductions mod F1. This is phi, and this is just the reduction of phi, so-called phi bar. Write my phi the same way. Mod F1. So I have um, <clears throat> this kind of commutative square. What I want to show is that the kernel of phi is finite type. And what I know is that M and therefore m to the n by repeated extensions um, are coherent sheaves by my assumption. Okay, so let's call this uh, let's call this pi, and uh, let's call this pi prime. <clears throat> okay, so I know. That the kernel of pi composed with phi, this map here, um, is finite, right? 
And note that inside here, what I have is the kernel of phi, right? So something maps to zero here, and certainly maps to zero all the way, um, all the way down here. <clears throat> But now, if something uh, maps to zero down here, what does that mean? That means its image here is, um, <clears throat> that means its image here is a uh, multiple of F, right? <clears throat> and so uh, what I can do, Sorry, give me 30 seconds to confuse myself. Ah, yes, that's right, sorry. If I turn it to zero here, it's in the multiple of F. So what I can do is I can actually give a left inverse to this inclusion in the following way. So let's call this K. So if we have G1, through Gn is in K, that means that the sum of Fi Gi, I from one to N um, is divisible by F. By F1, excuse me. So um, that means, but if I look at, I keep all these terms from i equals two and beyond. And now I add F1, not just times G1, but times G1 minus this sum divided by F1, I get zero. And the point is that this makes sense because by assumption, the sum is divisible by F1. So on the kernel, this transformation goes to G1 minus the sum and then G2, G3, so forth. is a map of this kernel by composed with phi to the kernel of phi. It's actually a, a left inverse to this inclusion. So it's a surjection like this. So again, because F1 is one of our first coordinates, we sort of use it to offset the difference between being in this kernel and being in this kernel. Now this is finite type, and therefore this is also finite. Okay, this is this whole thing makes sense without the kernel being finite type. Only at the very last step, once we get this rejection, do we use the finite type uh, assumption. Okay, so they give us our lemma. So now we're reduced to studying um, these kinds of quotients. And showing their good here. Uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break to like 10 10 and then continue?
Yes, it is actually. I mean, yesterday in the country. Oh, so I was a draw in Amsterdam. It was in Amsterdam. Oh, huh. one of these French games. Exchange half of the team after half time. Oh, I see. But um, actually, I yeah, I haven't really followed. Uh, um, we are trying to qualify now for the World Cup, right? I think they 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 both of the World World Cup is um, this time in the winter, right? It's December or something. In one of those things, uh, that's how. Uh, Um, I'm not sure whether Siegfried cares, but actually the, the best the, the best team amongst Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium at the moment, actually Belgium. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time that they, I mean, they have been really strong in this year, so uh, that would be served. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't really followed anything. I mean, so the Netherlands, do you know which group Netherlands uh, play in? Good. I don't know. But they're going to soon. I don't think that's inside of all. They're going to they're going to draw the World Cup. So certain pieces yeah. are the 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 Netherlands the Netherlands are the 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 have we lost our number one spot? Or will we lose Okay. <laughs> um, but hey, are the qualifications already decided now? Yes, they are. Oh, 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 oh. And Italy did. Oh, what? Yeah, I did the second time. Oh, yes, I did delete something about they lost uh, to some, some team that, never, yeah. that nobody ever heard of. Yeah. <laughs> but what they are passing over. 
Um, okay, so we have this lemma, and uh, our goal is not to check this criteria that, um, sorry, that O mod F is, um, is coherent. So we need a, a couple of inputs to make uh, this strategy work. The first is we need to work with a um, definable theory of y stress polynomials. So here is what we need from that. <clears throat> Suppose we have V and some CN definable and open. And we have P is a polynomial with coefficients in um, OV. <clears throat> in this new coordinate uh, W, which is my. P is a monic polynomial of some degree. 
with coefficients um, in V. <clears throat> and now suppose we have U is some definable open set in V cross C. Which contains the zero set of this P. The zero set of this P is like some closed subset uh, of V cross C. You can be defined by open arbitrary so long as it, uh, it uh, contains that. <clears throat> and finally, let's say we have F, some definable holomorphic function um, on U. Then we can write F as QP plus R with Q and R definable. And R, a wire stress polynomial of degree less than p. Okay, so modulo these sort of nice uh, Weierstrass polynomials, we have this nice kind of Weierstrass division theorem. <clears throat> Why do you call it a Weierstrass polynomial? It's just a polynomial in this ring, uh, right? Um, yeah, it's true. I don't know, that's what it's called, is it not? Uh, yeah. I think this construction of making this polynomial with these kind of holomorphic uh, coefficients is a wise stress polynomial. <clears throat> you're right, so, it's just a monic polynomial. Usually with wise stress preparation, you write, a, uh, you write an holomorphic function in the unit times a wise stress polynomial. Mm -hmm. so times polynomial, which you then call a Weierstrass polynomial. I see. I see. But anyway. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm not sure if I'm correct. Uh, it's, not, it's just a polynomial in this ring. Of it's just a monic polynomial in this ring. Absolutely. Yeah, that's all it is. <clears throat> Absolutely. So um, the, the proof is quite similar to the Libby case, so I'll just sketch it. So the first step is double generality assume P is reducible. Because if it's reducible, you just factor it. You do it one step at a time, each reducible factor. And then the second step is you just directly shoot. You say, Analytically, this is already known. This is just Weierstrass division. It's nice to work in the definable analytic category because you can steal from either the definable people or the analytic people, whatever, whatever is convenient. Um, and so R and uh, Q uh, exist and are unique. The only thing you want to worry about is showing they're actually definable if you start in the definable world. You don't leave it, right? Okay, now over a point little v in v where uh, p has distinct roots R sub V, uh, sorry, uh, R sub V, yes, is the unique degree P minus one, or unique polynomial degree at most P, agreeing with F, 
three with f. And thus is definable. Because you can just define it via that polynomial by interpolation, basically. And now this is dense. This set here is dense because generically you have k distinct truths if you're reducible, or degree p distinct truths reducible. This is dense, and so R is definable just by taking closure. So essentially, you can just steal the analytic case and just know that the interpolation is a definable operation. <clears throat> so that gives you um, Y stress division in this setup. Finally, we need this finite projection step. And that's a proposition uh, of Peter Zillan Sarchenko, which we directly use, which is the following. Make sure they're done correctly. Suppose you have um, U in CN definable, uh, definable open. And x inside u a definable analytic set. <clears throat> then there exists a covering u finitely many u sub i's. And linear projections uh, from CN to C sub power D sub I. These are linear. Such that if you look at what discovering does to X. Look at x intersect each u sub i. That'll be some closed thing inside u sub i. And you look at uh, the restriction, this l sub i here, going to its image. Then this is uh, finite. And l i x intersect e sub i is open. So up to this finite cutup, you look like a finite map onto an open subset of a lower dimensional complex analytic space. So this is a, a really useful uh, decomposition theorem, which they also use to prove their uh, definable sharp results. <laughs> OK, so um, armed with these two uh, tools, we can prove the condition in this lemma. Let's do that. <clears throat> Okay, so we uh, we use induction. Okay, so n equals zero or one is uh, is is very simple. So um, let u be some definable open set in C to the n. Take f to be a definable holomorphic function on there. Now let x 
be the zero set um, of F. Okay, so by the result, by the proposition over there, we can cut up into finitely many pieces such that uh, what's over there is true. Uh, by this thing, there exists some map Li from Cn to C D uh, I. Uh, let me not say the I, I'm just say Cn to C D, D less than N, and some V in C D <coughs> definable open. Such that U is in V cross C. And the map from X to V is finite. Up to a decomposition with a theorem to a finite cover, we can reduce to this kind of set. Okay. So in fact, because our X here was defined to be the zero set of a single analytic function, our X is N minus one dimensional. So a posteriori, we know this D isn't just less than N, this D is literally N minus one. Okay. Now, as a result, X is finite over some open set uh, downstairs. <clears throat> so we can form a Weierstrass polynomial. P. Which is in the string of monic polynomials uh, over OV, which is therefore also uh, OV. <clears throat> a definable polymorphic function on U, which cuts out X. And you form this literally by taking over every point of V, the pre images, the coordinates giving you X and forming the corresponding uh, product. So literally P is defined to be, like P at V is defined to be the product over uh, V, W, and X, uh, V, sorry, W uh, prime in X, of W minus W prime. Just make this product. This makes sense outside of a risky closed set, and then you just close it up to get it everywhere. <clears throat> so you get this Weierstrass polynomial, and then by your theorem, P divided by F is a unit. So roll log P just equals F. So we can restrict to the case of just dealing with Weierstrass polynomials. <clears throat> Okay. So now let M be O um, U definable mod P or F either one times O U definable. So M is a sheaf and it's zero everywhere outside of X. So we can consider this as a sheaf on X. The 
consider M as a sheaf on X. Okay, it's a sheaf of rings also because it's a quotient of a ring by a principle. Ideal. So we have this sheaf of rings um, on X, and uh, we're trying to show um, that it's coherent. <clears throat> So claim it's enough to show M is a coherent chief over M. We gotta show it's a coherent chief of rings over the definable structure chief. Instead, we're going to show it's a coherent chief of rings over itself. It's a coherent module that is over itself. And, and the proof is the following. Suppose we have a surjection from OU definable, or a map, sorry, to the N goes to M. Well, M is killed by F. It's just the quotient by F. So that gives you map phi bar from M to the N to M just by reduction. Sorry, let me call this something different because we already had a dimension M. Right? And now the kernel of phi is generated by F, first of all. So F times all the generators, F E1 through F E M, because they all have to go to zero under any map. And any lifts of generators for the kernel of phi bar. If you have any map like this, to get the kernel, you just throw in F times the generators, you reduce mod F, you get the kernel here, and you take any kinds of lifts. So if this is finitely generated, then that's also finitely generated. So it's not to show that M is a coherent uh, module over itself. And now the final step, finally, we look at the map L from X to V. This is a finite map, in the sense we talked about last time. Therefore, push forward is exact. So studying things on X is very close to studying things on V. Now, by our Weierstrass division theorem, giving something on X, giving something on F is the same as giving a polynomial of degree less than F. So one way of writing that is the push forward of M from X to V is isomorphic to OV to the power of the degree of F as a wire stress polynomial as OV depth modules. So again, what's the point here? The point is we're looking at uh, definable holomorphic functions mod f. Warsh's division says that's precisely the same thing at looking at polynomials of degree less than degree of f. And that's the same thing just giving all of the coefficients. And we have to give this many coefficients. And so we have this isomorphism um, of modules. <clears throat> okay, but this here is coherent by induction. OK, 
because now we're in a degree dimension n minus one space. And so that means that this thing is also good. Okay, so I'm, I'm leaving out some of the little pieces, but this is basically how, how the proof goes. So again, the idea is to start with your x, uh, which is zero sort of this f up to some, some finite cover by Peter Zewa uh, you can project down to a lower dimensional space where the projection is finite. That means two things. One, your F is basically a wash trust polynomial. And two, giving a section of something mod F is the same just specifying all the coefficients. And then you have this push forward trick to reduce you to literally studying CN minus one instead of just an arbitrary n minus one dimensional space. And that makes the induction uh, So th this proposition is proved by cell decomposition? Um, it, it definitely uses cell decomposition, but it's trickier than that. Um, it's trickier than that because But you also need wire stuff preparation for uh, for this proof? For proof. Some version of it, yeah, some version of it. I forget exactly how the proof goes. Um, because you want you want them. Um, so why is it not just cell decomposition? Um, the what? Okay. There is a some linear reaction. No, that's, these are arbitrary projections. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 sure. But I think I, I, the condition that you want this, this map to be finite is trickier than it seems, I think, uh, unless I'm mistaken. Because being a finite map is more than just finite pre images, right? You want it to be, want it to be a proper map. So, like, you want to avoid. To give you a sense of the kind of things you want to avoid, um, and avoid this kind of thing, so where you have, uh, I should, I have covered Chuck, so why don't you, um, if your set is this, and you're projecting down to the line, then you lose finiteness over here. Uh, and somehow avoiding this, I think, is tricky. Um, if that makes sense. Somehow you got to know this is bad, like ahead of time. Um, so I, I think even, well, yeah. So they were quite hard for this composition result. Like it's, it's, it's more than the, the simple application of the cell decomposition. I don't remember exactly in what way, though. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, other questions? Okay. So once you have this fact, uh, the definable coherence, you can kind of go to town and uh, prove a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so one corollary for x o x a basic definable analytic set, analytic space. OX is also coherent. So we just did the case of OC to the N, but the case of a general basic definable analytic space uh, follows immediately. The point is you have this exact sequence. So remember, X sits inside U, it's given by the vanishing of some finite set of functions. And so you have this exact sequence. Um, 
O U def in the R goes to O U def goes to O X. This is coherent. We've already proven that. So that means that um, if we look at the actual kernel of this map, then this is also coherent. And that means that OX is good. Basically, everything is a quotient. Everything you can get from all your depth by finding many operations is also going to be here. So all of a sudden, uh, you're great. I'm basically finding all of the pieces. And one nice corollary of this is that for coherent schemes, you can, in fact, check on stocks whether something is zero or not. So if F is a coherent uh, OX module, and S is a global section, then S being zero is the same as for all points in X, SFB being zero. <clears throat> the forward direction is, of course, obvious. It's the backwards direction that, uh, that needs checking. <clears throat> and the proof is the following. Well, what is S? S corresponds to some map phi from OX. <laughs> To F, which sends one to S. <clears throat> and by coherence, these two are coherent, which means the, cur the kernel is coherent. So kernel of phi is coherent, so it's generated up to a finite cover by finitely many functions, G1 through GR. Um, and now S being zero exactly means that these functions globally generate, right? S being zero exactly means um, that this map is zero, which means that this idea is everything. So S being zero exactly means that these functions generate. What does it mean for a set of functions to generate? It just means that every point, one of them is not zero. The intersection of the set where GI equals zero is everything. Sorry, the unit that is empty. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. The union of whether they're not zero is everything. Thank you. I think it's um, right? So this looks trivial, but again, this is only trivial because we have this fact that the kernel of phi is globally generated. If it wasn't globally generated, this would be a real uh, tricky look at. Okay, but if we know that the stock of S is zero everywhere, right? That exactly means that at every point these guys generate, which exactly means this fact over here. So for coherent sheaves, checking stocks um, is enough. Stocks at closed points. At closed points. And as a corollary, exactness, I'm not going to prove this, the same proof, exactness can be checked on stocks. 
more coherent uh, sheet. I.e., if you have a short exact uh, a complex f1, f2, f3, well, zero, zero. If you have a sequence like this of coherent sheaves, this is exact. If and only if for all closed points, the corresponding sequence of stocks exactly. Okay, let me give a couple uh, of other important corollaries of this. So, so one thing you get out of this by the same kind of induction is uh, definable no stellar So this gets at the kind of thing that I mentioned last time, where only humanity is very good at giving a uniform bindedness for point sets. And now if you want it for some kind of structure which takes into account uh, infinitesimals, <clears throat> you have this uh, definable Stillman sets that in X, so X is, how to say? I might be feeling myself. Um, so let me say there's two statements, I guess. Um, so the first statement is that X is no Ethereum. So any ascending chain of coherent subsheaves of all X stabilizes. That's no ethereality. And then the most telling that is that suppose that I and J are ideals of OX, so coherent subsheaves. That if the zero set of I is contained in the zero set of J, so if everything I kills, um, J kills as well, then there exists some natural number K such that I contains J to the K. So this is our general uh, multiplicity theorem definable world. So note that this is sort of in the in the algebraic world, this is the regular of telling us, right? It's telling you the correspondence between, I guess, radical ideals and, and uh, actual um, zero to close sets, but it's a bit stronger than that. In the analytic world, this is false, of course, right? Because you can imagine two functions in the complex plane, which are both zero on the integers, but one is zero with multiplicity one, and the other one is zero with growing multiplicities. And then uh, no power of the, the first one is divisible by the second one, right? This is exactly telling you this kind of thing um, doesn't happen in the definable analytic world. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so armed with this now, we say, OX is a definable analytic space. Yeah. 
if it has a covering, by basic definable analytic spaces. I don't want to go through the details, but essentially because of over coherence, everything glues up um, very nicely. And so we have our category. Yes, yeah, so covering always means in, this, in, the, in the logic sense, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to define um, two functors. <clears throat> So on the one hand, we have the category of, so I'll say algebraic spaces. And think of this for now, it's algebraic varieties. There's a small technical reason why algebraic spaces are better, which I'll say a little bit something about. We have the category of analytic spaces. And here we have the usual analytification factor. Now we have this category of definable analytic spaces. Where again, we've picked an O-minimal structure to begin with. It can really be anything up to now. And the point now is you can break up this functor into two smaller functors. So first of all, I'll call this also analytification using notation of it. So this is a functor where you take a definable analytic space and you just forget the definable structure. You just keep the underlying holomorphic set. Excuse me. Um, and the sheet of holomorphic functions on it. And that gives you an analytic space. And then you have a functor here now an intermediate functor called the definableization. <laughs> yeah, a name that we really like but everyone else makes fun of. So, you know, <laughs> um, where the idea here is you forget the algebraic structure, but you do keep track of the holomorphic structure as well as the canonical definable structure because algebraic functions are in every O minimal uh, structure. Of the kind that I consider that we consider. Um, okay, so you have these two functors, and the idea. Oh, I guess it's there a little bit, but in, in many ways, the idea is that this world is a lot closer to this world than that world. So a lot of the rigidity kind of properties you have here, you maintain um, over here. <clears throat> um, so I'll make a comment. What, why do we want um, algebra? Like, feel free to ignore this comment, as with everything I'm saying, of course. But this is a bit of a technical comment, but I want to motivate it. So algebraic spaces is a slightly more general world than algebraic varieties. Um, and of course you could include it just because you should go as general as you can. But there's actually an important reason to include it, which is that um, algebraic varieties or schemes, whatever, aren't a very good category. Um, algebraic varieties don't blew up well under the tail maps. So i.e. they aren't uh, well let me not say RE. Let me just say an example. The kind of thing that's not true for algebraic varieties, which would definitely want to be true whenever you're studying this kind of stuff, is that uh, if G is a finite group and G acts on your variety V, even in a fixed point free way, 
So it's like as nice an action as you can imagine. V mod G might not exist as an algebraic variety. Now, th this is a problem for if you're trying to study the existence of algebraic structures using something like this, because this sort of operation looks fantastic in this world. Everything you can possibly hope to be true is going to be true. Like think in the, co the finite and the quotient method is finite, but here and she is pushed forward very nicely. Everything is great. So if you're trying to prove any kind of algebraization theorem, a la Chow's lemma, for spaces, for coherent sheaves, for whatever, you're not going to be able to separate V mod G from V inside of this world. There's just no way to see the difference. Um, and so in order to get a, not, a big enough set of things here, so as to be able to detect them over here, you kind of have to enlarge this category to at the very least allow things like V mod G. And, and, and that is possible. So you can form G mod three in the category of algebraic spaces. Exactly, exactly. So algebraic spaces, what this is essentially is algebraic varieties, not modulo group action, that's a little bit too strong, but modulo a tau equivalent equations. So equivalence relations with normification project very nicely to both coordinates, which are smooth and project nice to both coordinates. Um, so again, this kind of, I mean, this is a very special, sort of the generic case, the, the legendary, the prototypical example of an Italian equivalence relation. You have others. They work super well in this space. And so you just need to enlarge the category of varieties to include this. A similar thing happens, um, for example, with Artem's work who wanted to characterize certain kinds of compact analytic spaces um, as being algebraic. And he also had to like, I guess, invent the category. <laughs> we didn't invent it. He had to invent the category of algebraic spaces to get a nice statement precisely because of things like this. Um, so he has a characterization of like compact analytic spaces with enough transcendental functions as being certain kinds of algebraic spaces and you can't just say algebraic varieties because that's very hard to detect from the analytic structure. <clears throat> there's very, I don't have a word of hand, it's a bit too complicated to be lightning at first sight, but there's a very straightforward example of like a projective variety in the group of order of like 12 or something acting on it where you don't have a quotient in an algebraic variety. These things just happen. Um, yeah. But so, you know, work, the way you work with algebraic spaces in practice you just write down a variety with an equivalence relation. You say the equivalence relation doesn't matter, and then you work with the variety. So practically speaking, very frequently, it, it's not uh, it's not really an impediment. But to make nice statements, this is uh, an important thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> Other questions about, about this remark? Okay. So first, um, okay, no. okay. <laughs> I think it was later, so okay. <laughs> um, so let me say something briefly about the identification functor. Um, so if we if we have our basic space um, x o x, then we can form the identification x o x and uh, x n. Oh, extend. So when you find one of those spaces, it's very simple. 
treat the you you had as just an analytic space, treat the I as just global holomorphic functions, and that's how you do it. And then you glue up when everything glues up fine. And then you actually have a map this way, a uh, map of, of, uh, of locally arranged sites. So what does it mean? Well, it's kind of like a topology where if you have an open set here, we wanted to give you an open set here under pullback. Point is every definable open set is open here and every definable holomorphic function is holomorphic. Um, and so this gives you a map in particular, gives you a map from many different objects here. You can like analytify to get objects here. But in particular, you get a map from coherent shields of X to coherent sheaves um, on, on, um, <clears throat> on XN. And um, the result, so this capital F, this function here. So basically what's a coherent sheaf? Uh, it's something you get by taking um, uh, OX to the N, having a map from OX to the M, and looking at the co -ground. So we just finitely many generators and relations. You can think of them as generators and relations over here. And the map is that this functor F, theorem, sorry, um, is, uh, is exact. <clears throat> Uh, and that's pretty much all um, that you can say. Uh, sorry, is exactly. Um, so what does this mean? So F takes exact sequences to exact sequences. That's what the exact word means. And faithful means that if you have uh, coherent sheaves, if A and B are coherent sheaves on X, then you get a map like this. So given the map between your two coherent sheaves, you also get a map between their Analytifications and being faithful means this map is injected. <clears throat> now, of course, the map is in general very, very far from surge mm -hmm. because if you let A just be OX, these are both just global sections of B, and you can have way more holomorphic functions than definable holomorphic functions. So, this is extremely far from surge but uh, the relation is at least injected. So, if something here uh, is zero once you analytify, then it's true over here. <clears throat> Okay, and I just I want to focus on this, so I'll just give the proof very quickly. Uh, and the proof is basically that everything can be checked on size. So analytic sheave is classical, something is zero if and only if its stock is zero, that applies to functions, that applies to sheaves, that applies to maps. And once we know it's true for a definable category, it's enough to just check this at the level of stocks. Um, and the stocks for the definable category and the analytic category look very similar. In particular, they look very similar to just formal power series. Once you complete them, you just get formal power series for both cases. So it's very easy to compare. Okay, but other than that, it's very hard to say anything about this factor because it forgets a lot of information. You can have different objects here that become isomorphic here. Um, and all sorts of stuff like that. So sort of all the bad properties of this functor, all the stuff we can detect analytically about algebraic varieties has a shadow uh, for this as well. So what we're gonna do next time is study this functor and show that this pr preserves um, a whole lot more information. Okay, thank you. In the case of um, semi-algebraic, um, the, the only research is, is just semi-algebraic sets. Uh, sorry, one more time. In the case where you have just a semi-algebraic set uh, as your amino structure. Oh, just 